ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome on stage your moderator and distinguished panelists. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm uh, Dominique Derriel. I'm the director of the Institute for Capacity Development. And it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all at this high-level uh, capacity development talk on unlocking domestic uh, resources for development through global partnerships. Earlier today, uh, colleagues from the Fiscal Affairs Department and the Middle East and Central Asia Departments presented how the IMF helped the Central African Republic and Somalia build fiscal capacity to tackle significant challenges associated with fragility and limited revenue mobilization. We will now take a step back and consider the broader picture of public finance in low and middle income countries. The G20 has called on the World Bank and the IMF to strengthen support to domestic resource mobilization. To this end, the IMF is stepping up its technical assistance and training on public spending and revenue, as well as development of the domestic capital markets to help countries finance their economic uh, and development objectives. This led to the creation of the Global Public Finance Partnership in January of this year. The recent review of the IMF Capacity Development Strategy also support these efforts. Today, we will discuss how countries build tax capacity, improve public spending efficiency, and strengthen fiscal in institutions to better meet the needs of their citizens. I'm very happy that we are joined by the Minister of State for Finance of Ghana, Abena Ose Asare. Uh, the minister is uh, both a minister and a member of uh, parliament since uh, 2013. Uh, prior to inter entering uh, Parliament, uh, the Minister worked as the Assistant Director for the New York University in, in Ghana. Very happy to have a former educator uh, with us, uh, which is uh, my line of business. A and she also uh, did uh, se had senior roles at Barclays Bank uh, in, in, in Ghana. Uh, next, to, uh, next to the Minister from Ghana, we have uh, Carlos Fernandez Valdovinos, who is the Minister of Finance uh, for Paraguay, with a vast experience in the implementation of public policies. Uh, Mr. Fernandez Valdovinos previously served as the Governor of the Central Bank of Paraguay and, and had other uh, senior role at the Central Bank of Paraguay. He held the senior position at the World Bank and very happily to, to say also an in international uh, mon monetary, uh, monetary fund. Uh, Next to, next to the minister, we have uh, the friend, uh, William Roos, who is the Assistant Secretary for Multilateral Development and Trade Affairs at the French uh, Treasury. He previously serves as the Director for France on the Board of Directors of the, uh, of the EBRD and as Economic Counselor for Southern Africa at the Embassy of France in uh, Pretoria. And uh, I'm very pleased to have right next to me my dear colleague, uh, Vitor Gaspar, who is the Director of the Fiscal Affairs Department at the IMF since uh, 2014. Before that, uh, Vito was the Minister of State and Finance for Portugal, and he had held various senior positions in the European and uh, Portuguese uh, institution, including Director General of Research at the European uh, Central Bank and Director of <coughs> Economic Studies and Statistics at the Central Bank of uh, Portugal. Uh, Vitor, if you maybe could kick us off, uh, you will, you know, in, in uh, tomorrow, present the key findings of the fiscal monitor. But maybe you could, I'd like to ask you now, if you could give us a quick picture of the main fiscal challenges that you see uh, low-income countries and emerging market uh, economies facing, and to explain why the IMF has recently launched a new fiscal capacity development vehicle, the Global Public Finance Partnership. So if you allow me, as you know, uh, Dominique, I speak very slowly. <laughs> so I will concentrate on low-income countries only. If not, we will be here for a long time. <laughs> In low-income uh, countries, um, prospects are slowly improving. The uh, low-income countries are benefiting from uh, an economic growth that is uh, increasing 
inflation that is declining and uh, financing conditions that in the last six months or so have eased. However, there are uh, important vulnerabilities and we normally say that we are living in a shock prone world. But it's very important to recall a very important line from my uh, colleague and friend Pierre Olivier Gurinchas who was saying this morning that estimates by the IMF of the scarring costs of the pandemic have been in general revised down but they were revised up for low-income countries. And uh, one possible uh, interpretation of that uh, unfortunate uh, development is that low-income countries were not able uh, to deploy as much fiscal support in the event of the pandemic and in the event of the cost of living crisis precisely because they face fiscal and financial constraints, which links to the topic of uh, this uh, session, this panel. We uh, identify three main areas where it is uh, crucial uh, to make uh, progress. The first is often referred to as accelerate domestic revenue mobilization I prefer to refer to it as uh, improving uh, tax capacity as the best pillar to found uh, state capacity in general. The second aspect has to do with uh, spending and spending priorities. Uh, spend uh, better, spend in uh, social policies which are crucial to uh, eradicate uh, poverty, to eradicate hunger, but also to realize uh, sustainable uh, development goals and uh, sustainable and inclusive uh, development. For that, it's very important to invest in infrastructure, but it's even more important to invest uh, in people. And uh, these countries typically have a very young and growing uh, population, and it's crucial to invest uh, in people. Last but not least, it is uh, very important to uh, improve the uh, quality of uh, public uh, finance management so that all of this uh, fits together in a, coherent wo uh, in a coherent whole that can support the uh, development objectives of the country. And for that, countries uh, can benefit from uh, outside uh, partners that may play a subsidiary, but still uh, important role. Thanks, thanks a lot, Vitor. Thanks for this uh, panorama. I can turn to you, uh, Minister Ossiasari. Uh, given this global context, wh what do you see as the, the most significant challenges that Ghana is currently facing when it comes to collecting uh, public revenues to fund uh, your economic and development priorities? And how can uh, technical assistance and training help in, in, in overcoming these challenges? Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. I believe it, it reflects the position in most uh, emerging economies as well. That um, when you compare Ghana to our, peer, our peers uh, with the same level of income and same structure of the economy, uh, we're doing, in terms of revenue collection, we're doing quite a bit low. Uh, currently, we're doing around 13% of tax to GDP ratio and amongst our peers they're doing in Africa 16.6% and then OECD around 33.5%. So clearly there's a challenge that we need to fix uh, to enable us also and the potential is there to, um, to mobilize more revenue and so there are lots of things that we need to address uh, to help us uh, move in the right direction. Um, first and foremost one of the challenges that uh, we see uh, in um, Ghana is the narrow um, tax base, uh, the narrow tax base, the, the, uh, most of the economy is not formalized. When I say that, I mean that uh, most of the people uh, are, are in the informal sector, and so we are not able to capture and then bring them onto the tax, and when it comes to payment of direct taxes. Prior to 2017, 
uh, we had about just 1.2 million people paying direct taxes. When um, the number of people eligible to pay taxes was around 6 million um, people. So clearly, you could tell that um, the tax base was narrow. And, and, and so we need to do something to address this. Another issue or another challenge that um, we're working hard to address has to do with the tax evasion and avoidance um, on the domestic front and then on the, in the corporate sector as well. You know, when it comes to the corporate world, they come up with all kinds of um, uh, tax liability, trying to avoid um, uh, payment of the right taxes and coming up with all kinds of accounting um, issues that sort of um, hide the total amount of taxes that they are supposed to pay. And then for the domestic, the small businesses too, what we encounter is that they fail to um, state the right income and that they end, the end. So that is also another challenge in that area. And when you look at, um, again, our tax, uh, our revenue administration, there's a lot that we need to do um, to prop up in terms of uh, reducing uh, human um, interventions and digitizing most of our, uh, our revenue lines to make sure that um, we are able to rake in more revenue. And also, um, there's, there's a culture of non-compliance. Uh, you assess, and they refuse to pay. And so we're coming up with all kinds of um, um, enhancements that will help us address this. Um, first and foremost, what we have done is to make sure that we have digitized uh, a lot of the revenue handles. And so making it um, it's virtually impossible for human interventions to, um, to reduce the revenues that we collect. Again, uh, government has come up with um, the national education system, where uh, with that, before you get your national education system, which is now linked to acquisition of passports, uh, acquisition of driver's license, and all those things, you need to present credible data. And so that data gives us information about you, and then we are able to uh, know um, whether you are eligible to pay taxes or not, and then we try to bring them onto um, the tax net. Again, um, what we have done is to use the carrot and sticks approach to enforce compliance. And we're encouraging um, where we need to encourage and where we also need to uh, take punitive uh, measures. Um, we're doing that to help close um, uh, the, the gap because we are hoping that in the medium term, we need to get to about 18 to 20% of tax to GDP ratio. And the potential is there, and I believe we can do that. Um, you also asked what um, technical assistance and training we will need. Already we have benefited from technical assistance on tax diagnostics from um, the IMF, and that saw us um, supporting us to come out with reforms in uh, um, the, one of the major um, agencies that collects revenue on behalf of uh, the government. That's the Ghana Revenue Authority. And there's been a lot of reforms, and that is yielding positive results. Um, just last year in 2023, uh, end of December 2022, we were able to come out for the first time with a medium-term revenue strategy, which is on the Ministry of Finance website. It gives, I mean, a fair view of the policies that government is willing and hoping to, um, to use to increase um, the generation of tax revenue, um, revenue mobilization in the country. And this is the first time it was through the assistance of um, the IMF. And so um, for that, um, we are grateful. And again, uh, um, the tax, um, the technical assistance is also helping us in, the regard, in, in regard to the reforms that um, we are seeing at the Ghana Revenue Authority, where we are trying to digitize most of um, uh, the way and the processes that the revenue revenue administration is handled and this is also yielding some positive fruits last year year on year we saw our revenue numbers going up by 40 percent they were able to achieve their targets and we're still on course again um, we're trying to digitize the various um, institutions that offer services to government so that we also reduce the human intervention in the collection of um, revenues. And so we are doing all these things to boost uh, uh, our revenue generation and also address the challenges that we have faced. And, but we'll be happy to also get more support in the area of the extractive industry because Ghana has just found lithium and we need a lot of knowledge in that to be able to assess um, the right um, taxes to maybe on such a um, natural resource. So um, 
in yeah. fact, that is, um, that is what uh, I can see. Thank you very much, Minister. Minister Fernandez, if I can turn to you with a similar question. How is Paraguay securing its long-term domestic revenues to deliver key services to the population? <coughs> and how can capacity development partnerships help in, in that context? OK. Um, first, let me thank you for the invitation to be here at this seminar. Let me start with uh, an idea or a thought I have always that we are in 2024 finally, and 2024 is four years after the pandemic, so we can start thinking and acting not about the urgent, that was a short run, right now we can think and act about the medium term, about what is important going forward. So that is an important thing for policymakers. Now, Given the high level of debt that many countries in the world had after the pandemic, it is quite important to start developing domestic revenue mobilization. That is going to be crucial. We don't have the luxury of having high or more debt at this moment, high fiscal deficit, basically. And so we need to do something with the revenue or with expenditure, by the way. So if you look at several papers, including some of the IMF, we know what are the results on the economy of fiscal adjustment. We know that rising taxes or cutting expenditure, depends on how you do both, they can have a recessionary result on the economy. That is not good when economies are still recovering from the pandemic. But in any case, the fiscal adjustment is absolutely necessary. So let's see what is doing Paraguay. Uh, first, for you to have an idea, the tax regime in Paraguay is very simple. We're a country of 10, 10, 10. And why is that? It's 10% corporate tax rate, 10% personal tax rate, and 10% VAT. Yeah, many of you will say, oh, that's very low. No, we don't see our tax regime as very low we see our tax regime as very competitive. Now, given that, we have to be very, very smart, rising taxes or reducing tax evasion, and also even much smart or smarter when talking about good quality of spending. But let's talk about what are we doing on the revenue side. On the revenue side until August, July last year, we had two different tax revenue collection agencies, totally separate, that they were not talking to each other. Customs and internal revenue service, or internal revenue, yeah, internal revenue. So they were not talking to each other, and there is a lot of complementarity or information that you can actually share between both of them to reduce tax evasion. So the new government that started in August passed a law that actually put both tax collector agencies under one head only. So we merge custom with the Internal Revenue Office. And right now we see the results. 25% increase year on year on tax revenue. That is huge. That is important. And now we can see clearly the theoretical resources that we were expecting before. We were intended to raise $400 million more in tax revenue. And six months after the merge, we already accomplished that. So we are going to get more, even more revenues for that. So that was a, quite an important and crucial development for our economy, so that with a given and very competitive tax regime, we can get more revenues. So we can have more spending in the areas that we have defined as a priority. Another thing that we did is to use non-conventional tax revenue in order to promote the development of the country. You may say, what is that? Two things. We pass a carbon law carbon uh, credit law at home for the first time. In Paraguay, 40% of the area is covered by natural forests. 
a large part of that is actually a national park. It's an asset and it's sitting there. And we can be useful for the environment, but at the same time, we can get some revenue mobilization using, using what we have in the national park. So given this law, we are now ready to actually sell carbon credits to the world. And that, of course, will increase revenue for the government. The second non-conventional part is what we are doing jointly with Brazil, with Itaipu, who is the sherry hydroelectric dam we have with them. It's the largest producer of clean and renewable energy in the world. But we are not seeing Itaipu as a generator of energy only. We are seeing Itaipu as a generator of development for both economies, both in Brazil and Paraguay. So we are negotiating with Brazil right now to see how by mobilizing the revenue that Itaipu has, can be used those funds in order to actually promote development in Paraguay and in certain um, states in Brazil. So those two non-conventional revenues for the country are going to be quite important to continue with the plan to put Paraguay in a better economic and social place. Now regarding uh, capacity uh, or development, what's crucial? The system of the different multilaterals, especially in this merge that I mentioned before. They were crucial um, in order to give some technical assistance, for example, for the designing what is going to be the organigram of that new agency. And of course, I agree with you, technology is going to be crucial going forward. <laughs> Non-human intervention is probably equal to more tax revenue. And to do that, of course, we need some support for capacity development, some support from other countries to see how we can actually design the dry process in order to have more tax revenue with the given tax rate. So those things are going to be important, were important in the past and will continue to be important in the future. So the IMF and other multilaterals will be crucial going forward in order to raise more revenue for us. Thank you, Minister. I can turn to uh, Mr. Roos. You know, France has been a strong supporter of uh, IMF fiscal capacity development initiatives for many years, and most recently of a supportive of the, the new global public finance partnership. Why is this work so important to uh, a country like yourself? Thank you very much, Dominique. Uh, I'm very honored uh, to be with uh, this, uh, the two ministers, with Victor, uh, in a way re representing uh, the different uh, donor countries. Of course, it's not only France, but you have uh, many um, supporting countries for, 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 for your program. And indeed, why uh, for us, where it comes from? So, I, I, we, we always looked at, at that and supported uh, the, these types of initiatives, but the Addis Abeba conference uh, in uh, 2015, I think, uh, raised awareness uh, not about many things, but notably um, the importance of tax collection uh, and domestic revenue uh, and domestic resources, uh, uh, domestic resource mobi mobilization. And so progressively, uh, we built uh, with our foreign affairs colleagues, development colleagues, and at the we, in the finance ministry, um, a comprehensive strategy uh, to, to, to support uh, this um, uh, this endeavor uh, bilaterally uh, through our French Development Bank uh, and also at a multilateral level. So we, from the start, uh, we try to have a balanced approach uh, with uh, bilateral instruments and also uh, looking at the different uh, institutions and IMF uh, is of course uh, uh, one of the most important uh, institutions to, uh, with, with also some others, to, which has, um, uh, and what we like, uh, a great uh, action on the ground. And so this is why we have developed uh, this, uh, this program to, to support this uh, technical assistance. 
More recently, um, with the, the, the different shocks uh, Vitor mentioned, and uh, the fa the, the, what we saw uh, collectively, uh, the, the, the di divergence risk, it was first risk of divergence, and today we see a divergence uh, between uh, some vulnerable countries on one side and the other countries on the other side. And collectively also, we, we organized uh, last June in Paris a, a summit to talk about uh, a new financing pact uh, to be all together, uh, the different countries, different uh, multilateral institutions, um, and NGOs, uh, philanthropies, because they also, some of them, and you have one of them supporting you, um, uh, with whom we, we work for, we work with uh, to, to, to to be together and uh, we, 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 we we discussed a lot about the different um, the different ways to have a, a, a financing stimulus uh, of course uh, bilaterally uh, in, uh, strengthening the international financial institutions but also uh, we discussed uh, domestic uh, revenue mobilization and the mobilization of private finance locally. Uh, it's part of the domestic resource mobilization and also uh, at, uh, at international level because we know that uh, when many experts uh, looked at how much money do we need collectively at the global level uh, to address both the SDGs at country level and also uh, climate, biodiversity, etc. for protecting the planet. And in, in the developing countries, most of the new resources has to come uh, from, uh, uh, from inside, uh, even if we have also to, to increase uh, financing uh, from donors. And so this, this explains why uh, it's important uh, for France. I could also uh, mention the, the fact that we are very active uh, on the international debt uh, architecture. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the Paris Club uh, Secretariat uh, in, in Paris. We have uh, developed the common framework for debt treatment uh, with the uh, over G20 countries. And if you deal with debt, of course, um, you need to discuss also, uh, we, we don't uh, negotiate about domestic resource mobilization in the context of a debt treatment, but it matters because if you want creditors uh, to provide additional uh, support through debt restructuring. You need also to be sure that everything has been done at home uh, regarding uh, having the appropriate level of tax and also efficient expenditure. So it's part of uh, a, a, global, uh, a global equilibrium. And this is for all these elements that for, for us, uh, this, in, this type of initiatives and notably what, what you have developed is important and we are very happy to, uh, to, to be one of the top, at the top for uh, supporting you uh, financially for the for your new phase and also uh, very important we, we like uh, the wh what you do on the ground uh, with Africa Central Africa Quest for example and um, we will um, we will uh, continue to support you uh, uh, as far as we can uh, for, for that thank you thank you thank you very much we've, we've talked quite a bit about uh, revenue but obviously one collects revenue to spend it on on good purposes so maybe minister uh, Sassari, if i can turn back to you uh, i'm sure that in your country like in all countries there's always a demand to say are you sure you're spending well you're you, you're putting your resources on the most important needs the, uh, how you how you tackling this uh, this this sort of spending issues and and, and what do you see in the, uh, going forward on, on that. All right. Um, public money. Um, once you spend public money, there should be accountability. And so um, um, for us, public money contributes a substantial amount to our GDP. And so how you spend it will determine the socioeconomic outcomes uh, in your country. And for us, I believe also that um, and making sure public monies are spent and spent well, there should be transparency and accountability. And clearly, you should have institutions and systems that will make it very, very easy and possible for these monies to be accounted for. Um, because um, uh, these are public funds and they expect to be used in a way that affects, that will have a positive impact on uh, your citizens. And so that is what we do. And as, as part of, our, as part of our strengthening accountability and transparency, uh, we have our Public Financial Management Act. And that sort of guides, uh, as we say, it's, uh, for us, it's the financial person's working Bible. And that is what 
will guide us in uh, utilization of public financial management act and, and finances. And with time, we've also um, come out with um, the legislative instruments that will give meaning to the, uh, to the act. Again, uh, in terms of um, transparency and accountability, the same act gives parliament and the authority to not just to um, have an oversight responsibility of the budget of government, but also to scrutinize the utilization. And this has, in a long way, gone to help the way um, public finances um, are spent. Uh, I would say, fortunately or unfortunately for us, we have a parliament that is near equal uh, in Ghana, where the minority and the majority are almost the same, with a difference of one. And so there's proper scrutiny when it comes to uh, managing our public financial management. Sometimes, even though it creates um, some sort of um, challenges, because the government will want to push through certain uh, um, uh, policies that we believe will help uh, citizens. But um, we sometimes face a little hurdle from um, Parliament on that. But they are also strict on helping us um, um, check how we spend public financing. And then also, um, one thing government is also doing to uh, make sure that um, public financing are utilized in the best way to help or support citizens is the fact that we are empowering the uh, independent institutions, um, um, like the audit service, the internal audit agency, and all the other independent institutions that will act as a check on the way public finances are spent. And so clearly, when you look at the budget from right from 2017 to date, government is making sure that uh, they improve on um, allocations that are made to these independent um, institutions to also help. Again, with the passage of the Rights to Information Bill, um, this gives any citizen at all the right to demand for some accountability um, from government on the way a contract was given, um, monies were spent on a particular project. And so all these things sort of opens up and helps um, shape the way public financing it's spent um, uh, in, in the country. And uh, I would also want to say that we have strengthening institutions. And we are hoping that with time and also with the support of um, some technical assistance that we, we continue to receive from the IMF uh, in the area of our, our governance structure, we will be able to improve um, uh, the loopholes that are in there that will help us um, have a robust um, way of um, guiding in our public financing. But on the whole, um, because it forms a large chunk of our GDP, we make sure that whatever we do, it has a positive impact on uh, the citizens of the country. Minister Fernandez, how do these issues of uh, efficient public spending uh, play up in uh, Paraguay? Yeah. Yeah. That topic is quite uh, important because you have two legs in fiscal policy, raising revenues, but then it's quite important what you do with those revenues that you have. So you need to, to, to spend it uh, wisely then. Uh, there is a recent report from the IDB and stating or finding that up to 4.4% of GDP of the region is badly spent. So there is a lot of room uh, that you can use that room in order to improve uh, with the same revenue, you can improve the quality of uh, spending in our countries. For Paraguay, the number is similar, 3.9% of GDP. So we were focusing on many things in order to improve uh, the quality of uh, spending. Uh, first, if you talk to your colleague in the cabinet, all of them have plenty of plans in order how to spend. I mean, if you want to find a plan how to spend, you're going to have zillion of, or billion of dollars. But as President Millet said, and I always reply, repeat that, no hay plata. So there is no <laughs> money for everything. And this is a, a, typically the fight I have. Of course, there has to be a decision. The decision is from the president in order to prioritize and this is key, priority is important. You cannot do everything in one government. You build a country over time. There is no single government that can build a country. So we have to put a brick on the wall also, 
or many bricks, but we're not going to finish the job. And we have to be conscious of that. So the president, and I'm lucky that he's an economist and a former minister of finance, he knows very well, he has given priority of the different areas. Of course, everyone gives some amount of money. And I continuously repeat to, the, to colleagues in the cabinet, given your money, you need to prioritize because otherwise it's impossible to do everything. And let me give you one example of what we're doing to increase efficiency. If you look at the glass, it's the same as this glass. But this glass was bought in the Ministry of Economy. This one was bought at the Ministry of Industry. And in Paraguay, this glass costs probably, I don't know, $1.2 in one ministry, and in the other is $2.30. That's impossible. But what happened then? Because they're buying the two things separately. So what we did was to pass a law of new proc national procurement law where you're going to be able to do actually Minister of Economy and the Minister of Industry working together on procurement in order to have a single price. And probably you know, because you probably go to Costco, that when you buy wholesale, it's cheaper than buy at the supermarket. So that is one of the things that we are doing with the, nation, the new uh, national procurement law that is uh, trying to put together all the requests that we're having for similar products and doing all together at once. That is a good way to actually save a lot of money for our government. Thank you very much. Uh, you don't see it, but we see it. There's a clock, a uh, big clock in front of us. It is ticking yeah. very, very fast. In a lot of pressure. Faster us. <laughs> than usual. I don't know why. So we're going to very soon open the floor for, for questions from, 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 from the floor. But before, maybe I'll just ask Vito if you if you could tell us a teeny bit more about the Global Public Finance Partnership. At, and given you know what the minister have been saying, what it is meant to, to do and do better than, than in a sense that or stronger than we have been doing so far. <laughs> Uh, thanks for uh, the opportunity, Dominique. We've heard a lot from the panel on the importance of reform being all-encompassing and coherent. We heard a lot about synergies. Just think about the, uh, the examples that two ministers gave about broadening the tax base both in the sense of uh, uh, reducing tax exemptions, but also make tax policy and revenue administration work in tandem so the effective tax base is actually broad. That requires many bits and pieces to fit together. And then, of course, the revenue side and the spending side have to fit together. If you allow me, Carlos, uh, many years ago when I was minister, uh, I was often confronted in the Council of Ministers by spending uh, ministers, and the Portuguese press reported that I told one of my colleagues, what is the part of the phrase, there is no money that you fail to understand? <laughs> now, the amazing thing is that I never said it. <laughs> it was simply made up, but I wish I had. It's a great phrase. But what the Global Public Finance Partnership does is that it brings everything that we do in public finance together, and that allows us to have a very uh, country-specific approach that can offer the country, two countries the public finance support that they need, obviously, with the support of the uh, generous donors. It's very important, and I insist on this point, that the support from donors, the support from organizations like the IMF is always secondary and subsidiary. The initiative, the political ownership has to be of political actors that are in the country, that are representatives of the country, that have the priorities of the country, but still uh, initiatives like the Global Public Finance Partnership can help and this subsidiary role is very important, Dominique. Excellent, Vito. We have time for a couple of questions. I don't know if, uh, yes, please. Uh, I think there will be a mic uh, coming to you. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Imam Shafi Abdul Karim from Nigeria. 
Um, first of all, let me commend the panelists, uh, most importantly, our minister, Nemeri Minister. Thank you. Uh, my question is this. How has uh, Ghana, as a country, been able, that's what we call tax integrity. I mean, tax integrity means that the government is asking for task, uh, ta is tasking the people. What has it done? Has it done to the people? Is rule of God. So, how far have you gone in terms of helping the domestic, the local communities, those that have not been able to pay tax, to be able to do so? Also, what have you done to your database in terms of uh, you know knowing those that are eligible to pay tax and those that are invading tax in your, and all the, the number three question is about transparency. You talked about. What had been the extent of accountability in terms of the spending of public funds? Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll take one more question. If there's a question here in the front, uh, and then we'll have the ministers respond. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for an interesting panel. I'm Andre from Romanian Academy, Institute for World Economy. My question is related to Mr. Kaspar. Hola, um, Batard. We are living in the age of digital revolution, artificial intelligence revolution, and we are, let's say, in the same challenges in terms of public finances as 30 years ago during the Stability and Growth Pact, basically in 1997, in the same, let's say, controversy. Do you think possible to introduce, uh, let's say, automatic flows in terms of public finance? For instance, we collect, I don't know how many billions of taxes from corporates. We shall allocate these revenues to support the investments of the companies. We collect, I don't know how many billions from VIT. We should redirect automatically without a discretionary intervention, I don't know, to build critical infrastructure. Do you think this possible to be introduced, first of all, main, most likely in the developed countries and afterwards in emerging countries? Thank you. Thank you for this. Two very good questions. Maybe, Minister, if you want to start with Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, um, tax integrity, you talked about. Um, um, like I said, we need to try as much as possible to introduce transparency and accountability in our collection of taxes. And we believe that the only way or the best way that we can do that is to make sure we reduce human intervention and introduce technology. And so that is what um, currently um, we have done with the support of uh, the technical assistance that we received. And again, we have come out with laws uh, that will guide uh, in the discharge or in the collection of these revenues. Um, previously, uh, way back, um, we'd never had um, any law on exemptions. And so people could grant exemptions on import duties and other waivers, um, um, which were revenues that should have come to government. Now we have put laws in place. We have an exemptions act that guides the way in which um, we grant exemptions. And that has also gone a long way to improve um, revenue collection um, as well. And again, uh, in terms of um, uh, integrity, uh, every year we are to send the budget to parliament. And in that, we show parliament the revenues that have come in and how we have spent those revenues. And so clearly, um, the scrutiny at um, the parliamentary level. And again, once it's public financing, the Auditor General at the end of every year is supposed to audit all ministries, departments, and agencies. And so um, with the report, it goes to Parliament. Once it gets to Parliament, the Public Accounts Committee um, sits on, on these reports. And um, whether, whatever queries or um, uh, issues that are raised, um, these ministries, departments, and agencies are called. Um, to sit and then answer to this, um, these queries. And clearly, we can see that uh, over time, the infractions that are caused by pu public officers on public financing has reduced drastically as a result of some of these things. Because it's on national TV, everybody is watching you and where you have um, infringed on the rights of um, um, your duty as a, a public officer. Um, sanctions that are supposed to be meted out to you are prescribed in the Public Financial Management Act and um, that is, um, is applied. And you also ask for the database, what we are, how we are roping in the people um, that we have been able to identify through the, um, the National Identification Card onto the tax net. And we have a roadmap. 
And so when you look at our medium term revenue strategy, it's all in there. How are we going to rope in over time? How are we going to rope in um, the new, uh, those who are not on the tax net onto the tax net? Um, we are doing it gradually, but we believe that we will get there. Once we have identified them, it's a good start and it will open up and broaden um, the tax base as well. Just please, something, please, please, sir. Yeah, because it's important tax in, uh, integrity, but it's as important spending integrity, mm -hmm. in spending transparency. That I forgot to mention also that everything on the spending should be transparent, and we have implemented that. Everything is available on the web. Who bid, how much, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And probably the controller is not the one who is going to look at that, but the people. The press will check those prices if they are crazy or not, if they are well spent or not. So spending integrity is also important. Spending transparency is as important as the part one. Exactly. And that is why um, for us, the Auditor General does the audit every single year. And so when you go on the Auditor General's website, it is right there and whatever information that you need. And like I also mentioned that we have put laws in place, the Right to Information um, Act is there. And whatever information that you need on any public spending, you have the right to demand. And whoever it is that is supposed to give to you also has that duty, that obligation to also um, give it to you. And so we are getting there. We haven't gotten there yet. We, I can't say um, it's fully done, but it's a process and we are getting there. And I believe that with the systems and supports that we have in place, um, clearly we will get there and reduce um, um, corruption and also continue to promote transparency and accountability in our public financial management. You told you want to say words about technology or you see the Absolutely. future? Absolutely. Uh, you were kind enough to mention a number of technological uh, revolutions. Uh, we in the Fiscal Affairs Department in the Fund in general, we take technology uh, very uh, seriously. And just think, GovTech is a fantastic brand, I believe, and GovTech is the future of uh, public financial management. But I do believe, quite uh, apart from uh, uh, that, it's the only opportunity that, that somebody like me has to be a revolutionary. And it's cool to be a revolutionary, no? No, but now, quite seriously, I think that you, want, you went too far in terms of automaticity. The crucial aspect, for example, when it comes to artificial intelligence, is to be able to design systems that mix artificial and human intelligence in a way that uh, makes our systems more, uh, more efficient and effective. And it's extremely important. For example, with uh, information technology and artificial intelligence, a number of forms of accountability and transparency can be made automatic. And having accountability in real time is extremely important, and I believe it performs miracles. At the same time, you cannot make democracy automatic. Fiscal policy is highly political, and that you cannot make uh, automatic, you cannot entrust to artificial intelligence. We will have to go through the pain of managing our own political processes. Thank you, Vito. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, we we have come to the uh, to the end of this uh, this panel, and, and we certainly encourage to continue bilateral uh, conversation a, a, as you can. I just would like to uh, thank our panelists today. So please give them a warm round of applause. Uh, for a very rich discussion that covers a very, very wide ground. Uh, there's plenty of work for all of us to do for many years, uh, as I can say. Uh, many thanks again, uh, as Vitor said, to, uh, to our partners. We are really in incredibly uh, grateful to them for the support they provide that allows us to help the, uh, our, I, our member countries. Just uh, two quick announcements to, to conclude. Uh, tomorrow morning at uh, 9 a.m. in Cedar Hall, which is on the first floor across, 
we will recognize the first contributors to the Global Public Financial Finance Partnership. So if you'd like to hear more about it, please, please join us. And on Friday at 4 p.m., again in Cedar Hall, we will have our final capacity development talk, which will be on governance, governance diagnostic for performance and accountability, which is a, a key tool to tackle corruption and promote good governance. Thank you again. Thank you very much for attending.